morning. Happy Sunday. How many of you couldn't wait to get here this morning to worship with your family? Oh, I know I can speak for Rodney and myself. We have missed you terribly. We're so glad to be back with our family. I want to invite you, come in. Come in from the foyer. Put your phone on mute. Find yourself a seat. Let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our minds. Let's prepare the soil of our hearts to receive an impartation today. We don't want to miss even a minute. So come on in. Find yourself a seat. Purpose to be ready. Be ready. Good morning, good morning. So glad you all are here, truly. A woman invited some people to dinner. Once they were seated, she turned to her six-year-old daughter and said, would you please say the blessing for the food? I don't know what to say, the little girl replied. So mom said, well, just say what you hear mommy say. All right. Little girl bowed her head. Lord, why on earth did I invite all these people to dinner? <laughs> Oopsie. A lady is returning a pair of glasses to, to the spectacle place. And she says, I need to return these glasses that I had bought for my husband. They don't work. He's still not seeing things my way. Oh, no. <laughs> all right, all right, I know. You look forward to this all week, don't you? Yes. Some days, parents, oh, some days I feel guilty for yelling at my kids. Then I remind myself that some animals eat their kids and I don't feel so bad. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, I've already welcomed you. You've already got your seat. You're ready. You're primed. You're pumped. We're going to be getting into some powerful praise and worship today. And I know there's going to be a life-changing word yet to come. But just for your information, a few things for you just to keep in the back of your mind. We've got revival prayer, of course, Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, right here. Come and receive. Come and deposit. It really is. It's a mutual arrangement. You come to corporate prayer on Tuesday to bring what God has in your heart, but you always leave full, fuller than when you came. Isn't that a, that's kind of a mystery, isn't it? Yeah. A supernatural mystery. I love it. But 7 o'clock on Tuesdays, we are excited to be back with you this Tuesday, so you don't want to miss it. Passover. Can you believe it's coming? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, Monday, April 22nd. It is a Monday. You did not hear that incorrectly. Monday the 22nd. What time is it at? Six. Six. I'm glad I asked. I'm a little out of the loop having been gone for a couple of weeks. Six o'clock. Uh, it'll be right here. We're providing most of the, the, the food portion. But if your last name begins with A to I, we ask you to bring a hot veggie dish. If your last name is J to R, bring a salad. S to Z, please bring a fruit dish to share. We always have lots of food. Thank you for your faithfulness to bring and provide and share of your bounty. We're grateful for that. On that note, if you signed up to cook a turkey for our Passover meal, you get to pick it up today. It's turkey day, or turkey pickup day, at least. If you did not sign up to, to cook a turkey, we still have turkeys needing to be cooked. So you can either see Candace, or you can see the Connect table right after service, and you can pick up a turkey and have it ready for next Monday to share. You've heard some talk of the Vine Love Ministry. We should be all about love, yes? Love should be the theme interwoven into everything we do. But we actually have a ministry dedicated to acts of loving service. So we're taking always, always taking donations for that particular ministry. You can always earmark on your donation, love ministry. But we're also looking for cookers. Next Saturday is a cook day. So if you want to go and be part of that in a beautiful industrial kitchen with all the toys, uh-huh, wink, wink, you can talk to Melanie or to Robin, and they can hook you up for next week. They also need food donations. You can imagine 
We're preparing food for the refuge, as well as always the homeless, and of course, our own local community. So if you ever know of a need in that department, you can talk to them, they will hook you up. Soul Care is about to begin. It's already next week as well. Excellent, I presume we have spots still. Are we full? No, not full. More, 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 Doc says, all right. Soul Care, fantastic. And if you've enjoyed the deposit of this past weekend, you got a little bit of a taste of what soul care is about. It's about healing on the inside and using God's word and the spirit of, of and, and his, his light, right? When the spirit shines on a situation, he brings light to identify. And soul care is all about going that direction and getting healing on the inside. So soul care, it starts on the 25th. You can see Doc or the Connect table, of course, to get more information. Uh, regarding this weekend, how many of you took part of this past weekend seminar? Many, many, many of you. That is so good. We have been tremendously blessed with the two couples that came to impart to us. Yes, we're very grateful. Thank you. In keeping with that, um, I've come to learn that there is a newsletter um, Mark and Maureen have a newsletter that they put out, I don't know how often, but if you're interested to be on the list for that, you can. You can see, I think our Connect table has info, Candace has info if you want to be part of that. Also, they do a bit of a referral program. So if you need some one-on-one -on -one ministry in light of what you maybe <laughs> discovered about yourself this past weekend, you can also reach out to them for that, and again, Candace has all that, so see her, get signed up. We, we should never stop healing, right? And it's not about becoming so focused that all we ever do is look inward to find out what's wrong. But when God brings people into your midst whose ministry it is to help unveil some of that, when the Lord illuminates something in your life, a pattern, then you definitely do want to take notice and get some healing for that. So take advantage of these opportunities to become even a more healed version of yourself. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. What about it? Oh, Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Oh, Money Life uh, Legacy. That starts on the 25th of April? There you go. If you need some input on your financial situation, Dave Ramsey is somewhat of a guru when it comes to that department. So a life group on, on that course will be beginning right away. You can see the connect table for that also for more information. Got to pray for something this morning. Go ahead. All right. So um, how many of you know what's going on in Israel last night? Yeah. Everybody watching that? Okay. So we, we, have a, we have a responsibility to stand with Israel to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and to, uh, to pray for peace over in the Middle East. We want to we wanna just lift up. So here, here what I'm going to do, I'm going to get Frank, if you'd come up on, on stage here with your shofar. We're going we're gonna to face the east, and we're going to stretch out our hands toward that. You know what? Just because uh, things are happening doesn't mean that the, the church can't be effective in breaking down some of those strongholds and stuff. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to pray an apostolic prayer of release of life over into that region in Jesus' name. We're going to pull down what's going on. And listen, listen, I, I, the, enemy, the enemy doesn't have power against the church. Amen. Okay, we're going we're gonna to stand up against the works of darkness. Even right now, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, which is what we do. It says, those who bless Israel, I will bless. Okay, I don't know about you, but I want to be a blessing. And I also want to be blessed in Jesus' name. So what we're going to do is I want everybody to stretch your hands toward Israel right now. This is the east this way. So, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Father, we stand as a people. Father, we stand as the church of Jesus Christ, even right now, uh, for the peace of Jerusalem, for the, the peace of that region, even right now, we bless Israel. We pray, Father, that no weapon formed against you will prosper in Jesus' name. I pray that you disarm every rocket. I pray, Father, that you would establish angels all around, even right now. I pray that your angels would encounter 
camp around, Father, those that fear you in that region, in Jesus' name. I pray that you'd raise up angels, Father, in Jesus' name, Father, to dismantle every rocket in Jesus' name that comes against them. I pray that they would explode in the sky without reaching their target. I pray, Father, that you would even right now bring confusion into the hands of the enemy in Jesus' name. I pray that they'd be confused. Father, we pull down every assignment that would raise up against your people in Jesus' name. I pray that your remnant in that place would be saved. We call forth the salvation of the sons of Israel even right now in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you'd begin to release blessing over them in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you, God, that as we bless them, Father, we are a blessed people in Jesus' name. And so, Father, right now, well, God, we, we bless them. We pray protection. We pray your spirit bring peace over them. Father, we pray peace over that whole place. Shalom over that whole country in Jesus' mighty name we pray. I pray, Father, that they would recognize that uh, that shalom, Father, uh, God would just cover them even right now. Favor is a shield. Psalm 512 over them in Jesus' name. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. I pray that you'd begin to open up their eyes, Father, in this day. I pray that they would look upon the one whom they've pierced. And Father, I pray that you'd restrain every devil. I pray that you'd restrain every army that would set itself against her. Every army that would partner against her right now. In Jesus' name, we pray that those armies would come down, that they'd be made low. Every mountain made low. Every stone removed. In Jesus' name, we declare that right now. And all God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah! 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 Thank you, Lord. Now we can worship Jesus. Let's worship Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. How many of you believe the lion of the tribe of Judah is ready to roar? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs>
Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way. Sing it again, church. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord. Oh, valley, be raised up. Oh, mountain, be made low. Oh, valley, be raised up. Oh, mountain, be made low. Oh, valley, be raised up. Oh, mountain, be made low. Oh, valley, be raised up. Oh, mountain, be made low. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Sing that again, church. Prepare the way, prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Prepare the way of the Lord, prepare the way. Let's sing it, O Valley. O Valley, be raised up. O Valley, be made low. O Valley, be raised up. O Valley, be made low. O Valley, be raised up. O Valley, be made low. O Valley, be raised up. O
Let the lion roar. Amen. Let the lion roar. Yes. Lord, I thank you for the groanings of the Spirit. That in this there is a roaring that will begin, Father. Yes. Not by the arm of the flesh, but by the Spirit of God. Amen. Let the lion roar. Thank you, God, for the release of your spirit. Yes. Thank you, God, for the release of your glory. Yes. Thank you, God, for the release and the revelation of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yes. Let the lion roar. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Can we give God a big, big hand of praise? Hey. Let the lion roar. Thank you, God. <laughs> Amen. Let everything that has breath, yeah. praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hey. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything let everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's do it again. Praise the Lord. Let everything let everything that has breath that has breath praise the Lord.
How many of you believe that there's nothing better than the Lord? Amen. Amen. Nothing can compare. Amen. So we're going to sing this song, Grace into Garden. And I believe he's raising us up. He's lifting his people. And he's, he's saying, hey, I am more than enough. Amen. Amen. I am more than enough. Amen.
search the world But it could not fail me A man's empty praise and treasures of faith You see, they're never enough Oh, but you came along You came along, Lord And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied
a little off track, but let's sing this. Jesus, in name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, God.
congregation let's lift it up to him is holy this morning. God, you're so holy. 
God, you're so holy, holy in splendor, holy in majesty. Lord, you're holy, holy Lord of all. You are holy, Lord, you're holy, Lord, you're holy. Hallelujah with me. Hallelujah. Lift your voices to heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we were worshiping the Lord, I began to see a couple of things, and I'm just going to release this. I saw somebody with their left eye just underneath, just, I saw the eye exposed just underneath and the white just below the eyeball, and I, I really felt like I was supposed to just release that word of knowledge so that you could be healed. If there's anybody here this morning that has a, in the left eye, there's something just underneath your eye, just, just above your eyelid, just underneath your eyeball. I, I saw a healing taking place this morning. And I also saw somebody's arm getting touched. It's your right arm. But, but I, I feel like it's, it's not as much of a healing as it is that the Lord is releasing the ability to create wealth in your life. Because I saw the moment the arm got touched, all of a sudden the arm went from one color to the next. It turned into gold. And I believe that the Lord is releasing. Um, there's, an, a, there's, a, there's a wealth transfer even right now being released to you. If you could just receive that by faith, something's happening even there. And uh, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for that. Lord, I thank you for that. Even right now, I speak life over those things. Father, I speak life over that eye right now. If, if you're here and you have that eye issue and you need healing, just I, I'm just going to invite you to come. I've got some people in our ministry team. They're going to pray for you. If that's you, just come. Maybe it's somebody online. I don't know. But we're going to trust the Lord for that. If you need a breakthrough in your finances, just put your hands up right now. If you need a breakthrough, just stand to your feet right now. If you need a breakthrough. What we're going to do is those people that are standing to their feet right now, I want the body just to surround them and begin to stretch out your hands toward them in Jesus' name. And we're going to pray for a breakthrough. So if you're sitting around somebody that's standing up with their hand raised, just begin to agree in prayer with me. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for a breakthrough. I pray for a breakthrough in finances in Jesus' name. Father, we release your presence even right now. 
I pray, God, that you would touch their lives. I pray, Father, that, God, there'd be a wealth transfer that would come to them in Jesus' name. I pray for breakthrough in Jesus' name. We release that now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we release breakthrough. 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 Hallelujah. And Father, for that eye right now, we just pray that that eye would be healed in Jesus' name. God, I speak to that eye right now. Those that are having troubles with the eye, I pray that all lesions, all sores, any cataracts right now just come off in Jesus' name. Any glaucoma, we speak life over their eyes right now. We command those sicknesses to leave. Infirmity go now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So even as we're just staying in God's presence right now, we want to give a room for the prophetic flow, just to, for the utterance of the Lord to speak through. So, brother, come. Praise the Lord. You know, over the last couple of weeks, uh, God's been showing me the river of God for this, uh, for this congregation, for this house. And uh, the word he said uh, last couple of weeks, he wants to say again, I am ever moving in your life. I am always moving. Even when you can't see me, I'm moving. And I saw the, 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 uh, the river of God, as you heard some of you over the last couple of weeks, where the river of God will, will be flowing behind the rocks where you can't see the river flowing. But he's always flowing in your life. And today God showed me that, that uh, in regards to the conference and what God was doing uh, here over the last couple of days for healing in our hearts and especially I saw you know the bitter root judgments and the inner vows that we've spoken over ourselves I saw that that there was this uh, the trees were like a canopy covered like a tunnel over top of the uh, uh, over the river of God and that there were people uh, they were camped out in there and and they couldn't uh, they couldn't um, they, they couldn't break free until they applied the simple God God is so he is so uncomplicated, isn't he? The older I get, the easier the Bible gets for me. It's just so uncomplicated, you know? It's just repentance, right? Repentance and breaking this stuff off of ourselves and forgiveness. Those are the big ones, big, big ones. And it all has to do with these inner vows and, 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 uh, and uh, bitter root judgments. And I saw that the people were there. They were camped out by the river. And this time, in the last couple of days, some of you have been experiencing the river. You drank from the river. Amen? You drank from the life of God. The Spirit of God was flowing through you. You drank of it. And He healed you. He healed you. But I want to declare that there's something else coming, and that is the renewing of the mind. And what God says to me, He says, jump in the river. Get ready. Jump in the river. Because I want to wash away all that old thinking. I want to renew your mind now. I want to renew the old stuff, that the stuff that was there that got you in that place in the first place. Because listen, we've all done it. We've all been there. We've all had uh, unforgiveness. We've all had bitter root judgments and inner vows. On every single person. It's not one who's, uh, who's exempt from that. And so, God, we just give that to you, and we just declare, Father, that we would jump in the river and allow you to renew our minds that you could take us into the next season of our lives in Jesus' name. into my heart all who are weary and heavy laden come to me for my burden is light my yoke is easy there are many of you that are have heavy burdens he's with you always he says before I formed you in the womb I knew you before you were born, I set you apart. I set you apart for such a time as this. You may not know me, but I know you. And I'm calling you into my love. Doesn't matter what you've done, I love you. Come to me now. Come to me now. Each one, come, I'm waiting for you. My arms are open to you. 
receive my unconditional love. There's no striving in my love. There's no fear. It doesn't matter what you've done. I love you. Come to me now. I feel like there's one more yet. Just um, got a feeling, so I'm just gonna just gonna wait. Let's just wait. Let's just, um, why don't we just have the congregation stand for a moment. Let's just pray in the spirit for a moment. You know, I got to say this weekend, um, my heart's been touched and, and my eyes have been opened. And, and, and God has been speaking to me that um, I am now ready for the harvest. And, and that's what's been going on is there's a harvest coming. People are coming to the church. People are coming. People are crying. People are yearning. Their hearts, they want to fill that God-sized void. And we need to be ready for them. And that's what this has all been about. Our hearts are being opened. Our hearts are being prepared. And now we're ready. I am ready. Amen. That's good. How many of you know that there's a harvest here? We're ready for harvest. Amen. This is a harvest time. I saw it in the spirit this morning when we were praying. I could see the fruit. There's fruit. This fruit bearing time for the church. Amen. Pastor Paris. God is always reminding this word. I told him again, Lord, maybe they heard it many times. But we people forget sometimes. And even most of the times, we forget the promises of God. And God is reminding us today again, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with my loving kindness. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Okay, just, uh, just please be seated for a moment. Listen, we're going we're gonna to give to the Lord. And uh, I, I love this part because, you know, this is something we can give back to the Lord and we can honor him we can bless him again why do we give we give because God is a giver we want to be like him amen how many want to be like Jesus well the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave you know that, that's his heart he's a he's a generous God he's a generous giver why do we why do we give it's because I want to be like him it's not because God needs our money he doesn't need our money I mean he can he could cause money trees to grow up anywhere he doesn't, he doesn't need our money. But what, what he needs is he needs, he needs us to respond the way he does. Okay? And so this morning, even as we give to the Lord, if you're new here with us, please don't feel like you have to. But if you'd like to, you can. You can give at churchofthevineatgmail.com. We've got machines my right, your left. You can do that. There's envelopes right around you. And uh, you can also um, go onto our app. If you haven't downloaded our app, go to CITV Edmonton on the App Store, and you could go on and download that. Whether you've got uh, one of the Google phones or whether you got like uh, like an Android or or an or an iPhone, you can do that both. Okay, so uh, CITV Edmonton. Okay, and uh, you can give an e-transfer at at uh, churchofthevine at gmail .com if you'd like to do that. All right. Why don't we Why don't we stand? Let's bless this offering and thank you. Thank you, the Lord. Father, I thank you that, God, you give bread to the eater and seed to the sower. I thank you that there's more than enough in your barn. And, Father, there's more than enough in ours. I thank you for the vats that overflow with wine. I thank you for, for um, the seed that we can sow this morning, Father, into your kingdom. I thank you, Father, that this church will never be in lack or never be in want. And I thank you today. I bless every person that gives and even those that can. Father, today we bless them. We bless those online today that are with us that are sowing as well. 
We bless you in Jesus' name. We pray favor on you that surrounds you like a shield. The shalom of God, nothing missing, lacking, or broken in your life in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's bless the Lord. Let's give to him. Amen. You can come up here. we got baskets up at the front if you'd like to do it that way. Most people are, are doing it online these days, I think. And that's, uh, that's the, way, the way it's going. But don't forget, when you're doing it online, say a little prayer. You know, Lord, thank you, for, thank you for this seed that I can sow. Just pray. Don't just throw it in there. You know, be intentional. Do you realize that everything God does is intentional? Hey, how many of you know that God loves on purpose? Right? He doesn't just throw it out there. He does it on purpose. He gives on purpose. Do you realize that God never speaks anything unless it's on purpose? He said, I will accomplish. So will my word that flows from my mouth. It will go out and it will accomplish that which I sent it out to do. It's always on purpose. It's intentional. So you can, you can bet that if God gave you a word, it's going to come to pass. If you, you can bet that if God showed you to give and, and you do that, you honor him, it'll come to pass. Blessing will flow. Amen. It's favor. It's what he does. Amen. All right. So who am I calling up this morning? All right. Why don't you, every, all you guys just stand to your feet right now. Let's just honor uh, Mark Sanford as he comes and brings the word this, mor this morning. Hey, hallelujah. Mark's teeth aren't turning blue, are they? <laughs> he said, do I have food coloring in my teeth? <laughs> I'm on now. Yeah. Okay. Is it turned in? Turned in. Do I have to, oh, I have to, do I have to go like this? No, just, uh, just this guy here. Oh, okay. This guy. Mm. There you go. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so. Lord, we ask you to let what we say be totally appropriate for where people are here today. Let it just hit the mark. And let every person go home feeling refreshed, uplifted, and most of all, knowing who they are. I wanted, can you hear? I wanted to start out with something. I went through something this morning took a while to come together. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah. They can. Okay. I went through something for a while till I could put the pieces together and I want to tell you guys, God wants to bless you, every one of you this morning. Like he wants to really bless you. And what happened, all out of the blue, I felt this blanket fall on me, this heavy blanket, and it wasn't the Holy Spirit. It felt heavy, and it didn't feel good, and I felt myself being pushed down farther and farther and farther till I almost felt like I couldn't speak. And then we had to get up to come in here, and I stepped out in the hallway, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, I was surrounded by these women, there was about four or five different women, 
And each one of them came up to me and put their arms around me, and they blessed me. Every one of them. They blessed me, and I needed that. I needed that this morning because I was going to walk in here and tell Mark, I can't go up there today. It feels bad. First of all, I want to thank those women who approach me because you don't know how deeply you touch me Hallelujah. and how much you lifted off of me this morning. Yeah. I also want to, in Jesus' name, lift that heavy blanket off of everybody that it's fallen upon. In Jesus' name, lift it off of them so they can feel the Holy Spirit, so they can feel you touch them. God wants to bless everyone. He wants to bless the people that aren't here. He wants to bless, bless the people that are <coughs> troubled in prison. He wants to bless the people that don't think they don't deserve it. He wants to bless us all. So, Lord, just bring your Holy Spirit down on everybody, on this whole church, on the world, on all of those people, and just let them know that you love them. Let them feel it. Jesus now, how, how many of you have felt that blanket in the, in recently? How many of you have felt it? Raise your hand if you did. If you have recently felt that blanket, yeah, a number of you. Now, I don't know if that's just an attack coming against you, or is that a principality in this region? I mean, do you know? Don't know. Yeah, anyway, something's been coming against you. And um, I do, Lord, I agree, with, Lord, to just lift it off and hide everybody here from the powers of darkness. We don't need to be subject to them. I'm going to talk about the Father's blessing today, and it's, I think it's something that you don't realize it is. Almost everybody has a, a false understanding, really a, a weak understanding of what it really is. And just before we get going, I want Maureen to share how she gave the blessing to the kids she used to work with. She used to work in the school system in what's called the resource room, and that's where all the kids with the uh, learning disabilities have, but also more and more every year, there's more and more kids who are there just because they grew up in troubled homes and they just can't sit still in their seat. And so Maureen blessed them when she was working with them. I went from elementary to high school back to elementary again, and I worked in the um, special, um, special needs section, or the, what do they call it, special education, where I am. And I was in the room that all the kids maybe didn't want to come to or felt bad when they had to come to it, or felt like they were the stupid ones that had to come to it. And they'd come in every morning, every, especially after the weekend, with their little heads down. They'd come in with dirty faces. They'd come in with no coats, no socks on, bare feet in the winter, like with their shoes, no socks. And hungry, and they needed someone to ask them, how are you? What can I do for you? Are you hungry? Let me go get you a pair of socks. We had a, you know, a little clothes closet where we'd get, you know, little coats for them and stuff. And, and some of them would cry. And some of them we would take into the lunchroom and feed them some breakfast. They just needed that special, special touch. And they needed someone to hold them and tell them how wonderful they were. Because a lot of these kids came from, they'd go from, one parent to another parent to another parent all week long, you know, and, and they'd come in from the weekend all scattered and, and some of them had bruises on their faces and they'd say to, you know, their little heads would hang down and they'd say, I'm okay, you know, and laugh and make jokes and I'm the tough guy. And, and eventually they would start to warm up and we'd 
put her arms around them and just love them. And then they could settle down and start to do their work. <clears throat> they couldn't work like that. But. And so many of these kids, you know, I think a lot of them, they were not unintelligent at all, but they had been told they were at home. They'd been called stupid, no good, and kids act out what they are told they are. And so Maureen, would, would she'd kneel down in front of them when they came in the door, and they would run to get a hug from her. And she'd put her arms around them, and she'd tell them, you are smart, you're a good kid. And when she did that, and they knew who they were, you know, when you know who you are, you get centered in yourself. And they would just get so centered and sit down, and, and suddenly they were not ADD for the next couple hours. They just could do their homework because they knew who they were, at least for a while. And, and, and some of these little children, there was not, it wasn't just me, it was a few of us ladies that did it, and some Christian, some, some not Christian. So, but we all did the same thing, it didn't matter. And there was the, the man that ran the, ran the, the, the room, he was a, a man, and a lot of these little kids were not allowed to go to him and be hugged because they were little children that were being molested by other men and they, he couldn't hug them. He had to send them to the ladies to do that. Not all of them, there was just a few, so. I want to read a proverb to you. And it's a proverb you've probably not really heard when you've read it before. And that's Proverbs 18.24. Whenever I give a, a verse, I'll, I'll say the verse twice in case you're taking notes so you can write down the address. Proverbs 18.24. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat their fruit. Now, stop and think about that. It, 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 we, we think, we, I think we kind of automatically translate it into the tongue has the power to make us feel alive or dead. But it's not what it's saying. The tongue has the power of life or death. The tongue kills. The tongue brings to life. <laughs> yeah. These little kids came in every Monday morning feeling like they had been killed off, like they were dead. And Maureen gave them the power of life. And I'm going to talk a little later about what Hebrew culture thought about this as far as the Father's blessing went. Children are desperate for the blessing because they sense there is power in words, real power. Words are so important. God calls himself the word. He calls himself the word. That's how important it is. <clears throat> John 1, 1 and 3. Chapter, uh, John chapter 1, 1 and 3 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And all things came to being through him. Words are so important that God spoke things into existence with his words. Genesis 1.3. Genesis 1.3. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. The power of words. Well, God calls us to be like him, doesn't he? We're made in his image. And we don't speak things into existence like he does, but if we are like him, our words carry a power to affirm that existence. We are his ambassadors, and we speak on his behalf. The first task that God gave to Adam, the very first thing he did in the garden was, I want you, Adam, to come up with words to name the animals. Find words that empower them to be what they are, because if words have power, you're empowering them. Yeah. You're empowering the creation. Adam named his wife Eve. He named her, a name to empower her to be who she was. And, and Eve means life, because she was the mother of all living. <laughs> and isn't that true about women? You know, with, without a woman in the house, there's just so much life missing. I, I can't imagine our house without Maureen. And you know, anytime your kids talk about going to grandma's and grandpa's house, they call it grandma's house, don't they? They don't call it grandpa's house, they call it grandma's house. 
<clears throat> because you walk in and she's just got this life. It's, and it's not that men don't have life. Men have something else they, to give. But women have this womanly life. It's, it's different than us guys. And oh, how we need it. <clears throat> to the Hebrews, a name was not just a label. It spoke of who you are. Proverbs 22, 1. Proverbs 22, verse 1 says, oh, that's not, okay, that's the wrong address. Oh, no, that is the right address. I was thinking of Psalm 22, 1. No, it's Proverbs 22, 1. I got the right address. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. You need it more than you need a billion dollars. Let me tell you something about how important words and names, how much important they were to the Hebrews. In the book of, of Genesis, um, you know, it, it talks about the story of Jacob and Esau, and you know the story, and I, I won't read the whole thing. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple snippets out of it. But, you know, Jacob and his mother conspired to steal the blessing from Esau and give it to Jacob. So his mom dressed it up, him up as his brother, and he went to his father, and his father was pretty blind, so he couldn't, he couldn't see who it was very well, but he could smell him, and he said, oh, boy, the, I can smell you, Esau. Yes, you smell like a wonderful un, uh, unmown field. And, and uh, you know, they didn't change their clothes very often back then because they didn't have very many, and it was, they didn't have very many sets of clothing and it was a lot of work to wash your clothes because they didn't have washing machines and so he could smell them. <coughs> he w Jacob was wearing Esau's clothing and then he said, yeah, but you don't sound like, like, like Esau, so uh, let me feel you. And of course, his mom had put uh, sheepskin, sheep, sheep fur on his, on his hands and she, he felt it and Esau was a hairy guy, and he had to be really hairy to feel as furry as a sheep. <laughs> so his dad felt his hand, and he said, I guess you must be Esau. And he blessed him. And he gave him these words. And this is um, Genesis 27, verses 28 through 29. May God give you of the heavens dew and of earth's richness and abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and people bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. Boy, this is just one dad blessing his son. But have you ever noticed that Jacob's descendants 3,000 years later Anybody who curses them gets cursed, and anybody who blesses them gets blessed. The, the power of, of one man just blessing his son. <clears throat> well, after Jacob finished uh, blessing, or excuse me, after Isaac finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, in came Esau. And he gave him some tasty stew and said, my father, sit up and eat some of my games so that you may give me your blessing. And his father Isaac asked him, who are you? Well, I'm your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled violently and said, who was it then who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it before him, before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. Well, Esau heard what his father saw, said, bitterly cried and said to his father, bless me too, my father. But he said, your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. Now, you know, have you ever stopped to think, well, wait a minute, why didn't he just say, oh, okay, I thought that was Esau, you're Esau, so I'm going to say those words for you. This is where we misunderstand what the blessing is. The blessing is not just a nice sentiment that we share that makes somebody feel good. It's not just nice words. They have power, and that power is so real, so tangible. It was so real and tangible, just like any object in this room, that when Jacob received it, he carried it out of the room with him. And his father didn't, yeah, yeah, clap, that's good. <laughs> his father could not give it to Esau because Jacob had it. 
these are not just nice words. There is a tangible power, and that power was as literal as the seat you're sitting on. Jacob had something we call a bitter root judgment in his heart. He had this expectancy that nobody was going to bless him. And so even though he got the blessing, he lived as if he didn't. He spent his whole life trying to make people bless him. First, he tricked his brother into giving him his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. And then he tricked his father into giving him the blessing. And then he went off to Uncle Laban and served him because... His mom said, please do that because your brother wants to kill you. So he went off to Uncle Laban and he served him uh, for seven years in order to get Leah. And then he served another seven years in order to get his favorite Rachel. And after 14 years, he was about to leave. But Laban said, please don't leave because I've learned through divination that I am blessed because of you. I'm prospering because of you. And so he said to, Dave, to uh, Jacob, name your wages. I'll pay you anything to stay. Now, if he was going to pay him anything to stay, why didn't Jacob say, just give me the best of your flocks? Because he didn't believe that anybody wanted to bless him. He couldn't, if a blessing stared him in the face, he would not see it. And so he said, give me the worst of your flocks, the spotted and speckled ones, and then he went and bred them in such a way that he ended up with the best of the flocks. Everything was up to him. Nobody's going to bless me. And I think one reason why he did that is because he had a father who could not see him because his father's blessing was wonderful, but it lacked something. And I'm going to show you in a minute what it lacked. There came a time when his brother caught up to him, Esau was coming with 400 men. And you don't come with 400 men to greet your brother and say, welcome home. You come with 400 men to wipe him off the face of the earth. That's what armies are for. And so that night, the night before his brother arrived, a man came, and this is in Genesis 32, verse 24 and following, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. Now, throughout history, people thought that man was actually the pre-incarnate Christ, because Christ stands outside of time, and he could go back in time. The man wrestled with him till daybreak, and when the man saw that he couldn't overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. One reason that people think it's Jesus and not an angel is because an angel could have easily overpowered him. But Jesus was not only divine, he was human. And apparently, he didn't have as big muscles as big as Jacob had. And so he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And then the man said, let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, if I was that man, I'd say, you know, I've been wrestling with you for eight hours. Why didn't you tell me eight hours ago that that's what you wanted? Well, you didn't because you didn't expect it. Nobody, I wasn't blessed by my dad. He was blind to me. I had to... I mean, he was going to, dad was going to bless Esau and not even bless Jacob on the same day. And so I had to make it happen myself. But then the man did something surprising that Jacob, I'm sure, did not expect. Everybody else thought Jacob was a deceiver usurper. That's what, that's what the name Jacob means. He came out of the the, the womb grasping his brother's heel and trying to, he tried to come out of the womb first and so they called him Jacob which means deceiver, usurper and you know that's really cute when you're a little kid it isn't cute anymore when the kid's 21 <laughs> and if you call a kid something he, kids live it out oh you tell me I'm a deceiver, usurper well I'm going to go ahead and be one and so the man told Jacob something Jacob hadn't heard from his father. His head, father told him all sorts of wonderful things that would happen to him. God will give you heaven's dew, earth's richness, the abundance of grain and wine. Nations will serve you. Peoples bow down to you. You'll be lord over your brothers. And those who curse you will be cursed and bless you will be blessed. That's all very nice, but there's something missing. There's nothing in it about who Jacob is. 
There's nothing to counter the fact that people always called him a deceiver, usurper. Those are just nice things that will happen to him. Something wasn't satisfied in Jacob's heart. And so Jacob said, or excuse me, the man said to Jacob, when Jacob said, yeah, I'm not going to let you go, you have to bless me. The man said to Jacob, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which means fights with God, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. In other words, you know, Jacob, okay, you've fought in all the wrong ways, you have deceived, you have usurped, you've stolen your brother's everything, you've cheated your, your father, you've, you've cheated your uncle Laban, but at least you fought. And no matter how wrong you did it, I like the fighter, because all the things you did bad, that is, that's something you did, but the fighter is who you are. That's what God designed you to be. And I like it. And something settled inside of Jacob that happened. It was, it was just like those kids who came on Monday morning who'd been beaten up during the weekend and told that they were just no good little nothings. Something settled inside of Jacob. And it says in verse 30, So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying it's because uh, God, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Now, he had just been told, you have struggled with God and men and have overcome. You've beaten God. That's another reason why they think it was the pre-incarnate Christ, because he was God. You've struggled with God and men and overcome, but Jacob turns right around, and for the first time, this arrogant deceiver who's always cheating everybody becomes humble enough to say, they call the place Peniel, saying, it's because I saw God face to face, yet my life was spared. You know, you're telling me I, I beat God and men? No, I didn't. You spared me. You let me win. In verse, chapter 34, excuse me, chapter 33, verse 1, Jacob looked up and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. But in, chap in verse 4, it says Esau, verse four, chap uh, chapter 33, verse 4, Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and he threw his arms around his neck and kissed him and they wept. Esau surprised himself by reconciling. And Esau looked up and saw the women and children and said, what, who are these with you? Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. I didn't make it happen. He, all his thought, what life? He just thought, I made everything happen. No, I didn't make it happen. God graciously gave them to me. In verse 8, Esau asked, what, are these, what do you mean by all these droves I met? In other words, Jacob has sent flocks of animals ahead of him, thinking, okay, I, 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 I cheated him out of his birthright, out of his in, half of his inheritance, so I'm going to give him all this stuff, and maybe, maybe that'll pacify him. But Jacob says, to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, said Jacob. I have found favor in your eyes. Accept this gift from me, for to see your face is like seeing the face of God. That same phrase, Peniel, face of God. Now that you've received me favorably. Please accept the present that was brought to you, for God has been gracious to me, and I have all I need. I'm satisfied. I don't have to grasp for anything. I don't have to cheat anybody out of anything. I have what I need. And I have what I need because, because I saw, I finally saw God, and, and I, for the first time in my life, I saw God blessing me through another human being. And, and when the blessing stared me face to face, I, I saw it. And I, who, guess who I saw it in? That stinky brother I always hated. <laughs> later on, Jacob, later on, Jacob, uh, when he was older and had a family of his own and had many children. He sat them all down to bless them one day and he did different than his father did. His father was only going to bless 
Esau and not Jacob on the day that he blessed him. Jacob learned because somebody had told him who he was. Somebody had empathized with him. Somebody had felt with him. He was able to recognize, I need to bless all my kids on the same day so they don't get jealous like I was. And he didn't just tell them nice things that would happen to them. He told them who they were. Genesis 49, verse 9. Genesis 49, verse 9. You are a lion's cub, O Judah. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? Genesis 49, 21. Naphtali is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. He gives beautiful words. Totally opposite kids, and he sees every one of them for who they are, and he tells them who they are because he knows that there is power in the blessing. The average, back then, we, when a son, if a son did not get his father's blessing, he knew his life would not go well. And that's why Esau wept bitterly and said, please, is there a blessing for me too, father? It's the reason why uh, when... Um, when uh, uh, Abraham did not have a son, he adopted Eliezer of Damascus. Now, Eliezer of Damascus was clear over in Damascus a long way away, but at, at least Eliezer of Damascus knew his life would go well because some man, somewhere, some father was telling him who he was, was blessing him. And there was power in it. When you look at the blessings that Jacob gave his 12 sons. Verse 27, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. Totally different than Naphtali who bears beautiful fawns. His 12 sons, and, and keep in mind that the, I, Jacob was not a famous man yet. One day he would be because his son would be the second guy in the whole world uh, next to Pharaoh and feeding the entire world. But he was just a father with 12 sons. Fairly prominent in his region, but not world famous like now. His 12 sons produced 12 tribes of descendants, and 3,000 years later, millions of people are living out the blessings that one father gave his son. That is the power of words. Here's just one example of what happens with the Jews. Between 1901 and 2023, last year, 965 people received the Nobel Prize, 965. And at least, during that whole time, at least 214 were Jews. That's 22% of all of them. Even though the Jews constitute one-fifth of 1% 1 of the population of the world. So Jews are 110 times more likely than anybody else to win the Nobel Prize. Yeah, and just look at every other way. They, the Jews prosper everywhere they go. They prosper. Well, if positive words are that powerful, what does that say about negative words? Like idiot, good for nothing. I don't think you'll ever grow up. You'll never amount to anything. When we use negative words like you are bad, we tempt our child to believe and act out what we say they are. Jacob became the deceiver usurper, but then he became the fighter in the right sense when somebody told him who he was, a father in Christ outside of his family. We tempt our child to believe and act out what we tell them they, they are. Maureen often shares this example, and, and you know, you can do it without even meaning to. Maureen used to tell Jonah to smarten up and one day, Jonah asked, why are you telling me I'm stupid? <laughs> she, <laughs> well, you have to come up and you have to speak on the microphone. Just, yeah, you don't have to come up, but just speak on the microphone. All, all Jonah's life, from when he was a little boy, he would, I would tell him to smarten up if he, you know, whatever, he was naughty. When he got to high school, he finally asked me, he said, why did you always tell me I was stupid? He thought I was telling him he was stupid all those years. So that, that was interesting. And you just meant to just, you know, stop doing something naughty. That's all. Yeah. 
<laughs> there was a man I, I knew whose father would, and, and he would say this in front of anybody who was around, he would, and he, in front of his little child, a seven-year-old boy, he would tell everybody, I don't think he's ever going to grow up. He'll probably never get married and hold down a job because he's so immature. And he was seven years old. Well, you know, when he grew up, guess what? He never got married. Sometimes he held down a job and it was nothing more than like working in, in a store stocking shelves or something. Hmm. Yeah. We tempt our children to expect people to treat them that way. It's like we paint a target on our child. You ever notice that children who are bullied at home are also bullied at school? You know, you, you, find, you look at the bully's life and you find out quite often he's being bullied at home too because he expects it. He's learned to expect it. Just as the Holy Spirit empowers a blessing, the powers of darkness empower negative words because as it says in John 8, 44, John 8, 44 says, Satan is the father of lies. And so when we tell our children these lies about who they are, we say to the powers of darkness, you have a right to lie to my children about who they are. You have a right to tell others to do the same. And that's another reason why the child, if he's bullied at home, he often gets bullied at school. Because we have given the powers of darkness permission to do so. And even a lack of words can become a curse because if you don't tell your child who he is, somebody else out there will. And the, and the other kids are pretty nasty sometimes. And whether or not that happens, our kids will guess at who they are. And kids almost always guess negative because they think, well, if nobody tells me who I am, I must not be worth much. And so they guess that I'm just a worthy per worthless person. So I want to talk about healing. First of all, of course, you need to stop cursing and start blessing. But if that's all you do, it's like this. In James 3.10, James 3.10, it says, From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh water and bitter water? Well, this is what happens. You know, some parents, they don't think to, to pray over their child, to speak over their child and say, son, this is not who you are. I should not have told you you're good for nothing. I should not have told you you're stupid. Or you're not given the, using the brains God gave you. I should not have said those things. And I want you to believe that they're not true. And, and I'm going to tell you who you really are. So many people, they don't do that. They just stop cursing and they start saying nice things. But look at this. If this is the bitter water that's in the heart of your child because you told your child how bad he is, and I'll move this out of the way so that people can see it over there on the left. If all you do is decide to start saying nice things, you end up with slightly diluted bitter water. I mean, the, the child's not going to feel very blessed, and so what do you have to do? You have to pour it out, and you say to your child, this is not who you are. I was wrong. I should never have spoken that way to you. <laughs> and even pray, Lord, I revoke the power of those words over my child, and pray it in the child's presence, and then you bless your child, and to the child it looks like a blessing. It's clear, it's pure. Ah, that thing is heavy. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. And you know, children also need the blessing when they're all grown. You know, God did this for his son. He blessed him with words. When Jesus was born, God knew the whole world would call him names. <laughs> Still doing it today. And so God sent three wise men. Who, and you know, he, got, he gave him parents, I'm sure, who very much blessed him. But you need it from more than just your mom and dad. And so he sent it three wise men from a distant country. 
And he had to go to a distant country to find them because there weren't very many people in Israel who could do it. I mean, have you ever noticed that when the wise men came and inquired in Jerusalem, where can we find the Messiah? That then, and they all told him where he, he, they could find him, even though they knew that the authorities would kill him because Herod was this, this crazy guy who just killed anybody he th thought would get his, his throne. So he, he, they sent him, they sent the three wise men to find him for them. And when they did, nobody in Jerusalem followed them there so that they could bless the little baby Messiah. And afterwards, they wanted to kill him. And so the three wise men gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold for a king, frankincense for a priest, myrrh for a healer, telling him who he was in various aspects. I'm sure his parents reminded him that. And when he grew up, Jesus still needed to hear who he was from his father. And so right when he started his ministry, the father said, and this is in Mark 1.11, Mark 1.11, you are my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And he wasn't ashamed, God wasn't ashamed to say it in front of the whole world. So if, if even Jesus needed that, and if he needed that even as a grown-up, how much more do our children need it? I was going to read a story of someone who gave a blessing, but I think I don't want to take up more time. I want, uh, I want you to come up, um, John Elijah, because you have some words about sonship you want to share. Isn't this good? I like Mark's Bible. It's so big it could be a club. <laughs> um, just real quick before I share, if any of the men have kind of that heavy blanket, I know it's because the Canucks beat the Oilers last night. <laughs> <laughs> no throwing stones at the prophets. Uh, Could you give me my glasses that are up there? Oh, okay. I'll use this mark. It's okay. You hold on to that. These are Maureen's glasses. Oh, Maureen's glasses? Yeah. Okay. I, I want to add a piece. Uh, and uh, how much time do we have, Pastor? All day. All day. I like you guys. Um, because I want to, I've been sharing a message recently about sonship. And I want to add a few dimensions and things that the Holy Spirit taught me about sonship to tie into what uh, Mark is sharing about the blessing. Now, uh, some of you know my story coming out of the world, you know, being a drug dealer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Coming into church, uh, finding a place to, uh, to come to. I've been in the same church 31 years. But there was something missing in my life. Now, I, I had this encounter with the Lord. I had this encounter this way with him. And things were starting, you know, I, things were starting to change. But there was something missing. So God started to deal with my independent spirit. God started to deal with my independence that looked at miss me and God. Just me and the Lord. I got you, God, and I don't really need anybody else. And I was starting to get revelations, and things were starting to happen in my life, but there was something missing. One day the Lord, and I've shared this before, but for new folks here, I'm going to share. So I, I was in the church for already about 10 years. And I could see other people being blessed, but something was missing for me. Did I hear God? Yes. Did I know the Lord? Yes. But there was a missing link for me, a, a different aspect, something that hadn't translated to my being. And it had to do with the blessing of a father. It had to do with something that had not been translated yet to me through a spiritual father. Now, I didn't really know I had an independent spirit. I didn't know it. I thought, I'm doing pretty good with God, but there's something missing. I would watch other people being released. And I'd be like sitting there going, actually, I'm more gifted than they are. Ouch. 
So this one day, I heard the Holy Spirit start to say to me, son, I want to deal with something in you. And I said, kind of a bit flippantly to the Lord, kind of like, yeah, okay. He goes, no, you don't understand. I tried to deal with this eight years ago, and you didn't let me. And if you don't let me this time, you are going to go another six or eight years in the wilderness, and then I'll try again. Well, this time, the fear of the Lord hit me, and I went in my prayer room, and I got on my face, so-called eating carpet. And how many of you know that carpets are quite stinky? <laughs> kind of like Esau, I guess. So here I am on my carpet, and I would lay there. And I would lay there, and I would lay there month after month, one month, Randy, two months, three months, four months, five months, six, six months, I'm, and God is not speaking to me yet. But my posture of my heart was to lay on my face before the Lord. Because he was serious. He said, listen, I want to deal with something in you. And it wasn't just because I love you. The fear of the Lord hit me. Boy, there's a, health, there's a great message there, hey? Amen. On the fear of the Lord being the beginning of wisdom. So I laid there. And one day, up six and a half months in, the Lord said, you have an independent spirit. And you don't actually submit to anybody. Don't say man exactly, just say ouch. And I said, God, I don't even really know how to change. I don't know what to do, but I am asking you to deal with my heart and change me. Now, what he was trying to do was set me up for the blessing of a father. He was trying to set me up to get my blessing. So... I said, okay, whatever you have to do in me, please, I'm asking you, start to do it. I don't want to miss my destiny. And I don't want to go another six or eight years in the wilderness. Me and Jesus, was he with me? Sure he was. Is he a good father? Yeah. But I was missing a principle in the word of God it had to do with submitting to authority, being undercover, getting the blessing of someone in my life. So here's what happened. I said, God, do what you need to do, whatever it takes. I, am, I, am, I don't want to go another six, eight years. And I began to repent for my independent spirit. I began to repent for thinking, oh, I know more than the pastors and the leaders. I know everything because I got me and Jesus. I had so many blind spots. I mean, oh my gosh. So I start to repent. I start to pray. And, and, I, and I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to submit to the leadership I've given you. And I was like, oh, okay. What if they're wrong? <laughs> that's not what I said to you. Now, that's a whole message in itself, and I'm going to cut a bit of my message short so Mark can add some more pieces if we need to. If you guys can linger today, there's a breakthrough for some of you. Because when I was sitting there earlier, I saw a number of you, especially younger generation, there is a spirit of lawlessness in the land, friends. And there is a spirit of independence, and it's just me and Jesus, and I'm going to do whatever I want. But let me tell you, there is a divine order to the kingdom. There is a divine order in this house. And we submit to the pastor leaders here. Your pastors have the right to correct us. If we say something out of order, they can speak to us. Because we know the order in the house. So here's what happened. I, 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 I'm, God's dealing with me. I said, okay, Lord, I'm willing to submit. So now I've been in the church quite a while at that time. Now it's 31 years. I think at that time it was around 10 years, maybe a little longer. So I'm in the prayer meeting, and my senior leader, Papa Gideon, comes back from a trip. And I hadn't seen him in months and months and months, because at that time he started to travel all over the world, and I would see him more occasionally. So I'm in the prayer room, and I'm standing, in the, it's a prayer meeting, and he comes in a little late. And I told you this before, but I'm going to give you some more scripture this time. So he comes in, and he walks across the room. And he stops by me, and he points, you, you, 
you're fully aligned with me now. I'm going to release you to the nations. And he walks away. He was so sensitive. The father in him knew that my spirit, God, was changing me to align with the authority of the house. You, he said, are fully aligned. And he, I hadn't seen the guy in months. He walks by and he just stops. Boom. Boom. You. And they started to release me to the nations. Now, I want to share a couple principles around this, especially for the younger generation and some of the older, because some have not understood this at some level. In the book of Exodus, okay, in the book of Exodus chapter 33, it's the story after chapter 32, you know, they make the golden calf, and God gets angry with them, you know, and, and you know the story. So in Exodus 33, they camp, and Moses sets up the tent of meeting outside the camp, right, or the tabernacle, the tent. And the Bible says, now there's four people in this story, in here, and this is a really important story. If I had more time, I would teach you why Moses understood. You know, God says, listen, you guys are stiff-necked, remember? I'm going to send my angel, and Moses is like, God, if it's not your presence... If it's not your presence, how will they know we're different? If it's just your angel, right? And that's a whole message. But I want to touch on a couple points here because there's four people in this story. There's four different scenarios. And the one is, so they set up the tabernacle of meeting, correct? And the Bible says that anybody could go to the tabernacle. To meet God, right? The tabernacle in verse 7, 33, Exodus 33, 7, everyone who sought the Lord could go to the tabernacle. That's what the Bible says. Number In verse 8, though, it says, the people would watch when Moses went to meet the Lord, and they would stand, it says, in, the, in verse 9 and 10, as Moses entered the tabernacle, the people would stand in their tent doors and watch. Now, this was part of my problem. I was the guy standing in the tent door watching what was going on. But sometimes because of my rebellion, I wasn't doing something else. So here's Moses. He's actually the leader. Now, I don't know what was going on with the other people in the tent because people could go and meet God. But clearly the Holy Spirit chose Moses to lead them out, correct? Is that what the Bible says? Am I right, pastors? But God began to show me, son, there's another guy in this story. Do you know who he was? Who was the other guy in the story? The Bible says, so in Exodus 33, 11, so the Lord spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, uh, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. And the Holy Spirit began to say to me, Son, stay close to your father. Stay close to those that I'm calling to lead at this hour. And by the way, it's not you. It's not you. I am calling you to serve another man's vision. And so the Lord began to speak to me and say, Son, stay close to the fathers. That generation that was leading in my life, that it wasn't my time to be the leader. It was my time to be the son it was my time to be the one to stay close to the fathers and the mothers, the ones who were anointed and appointed at that time to lead the church. And so I began to stop being the one standing in the door of the tabernacle, and I drew close. When there was a prayer meeting, I was there. When there was something going on, I was there. And if I wasn't leading, I was praying for the leaders. I was the one backing them up. Father, bless them as they're called to lead. Father, I hold up their arms. 
Father, I, 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 I choose to bless them. And if I don't have the talking stick, I'm okay. This is the talking stick. I'm okay. I'm okay in my place. Now, in this church, there are some good folks, and you are submitted, and I know it. But I also know there's others of you that God is going to prompt you that your frustration is because you haven't fully aligned. You have not yet got the blessing of the house. And in this season, the transition of this church is to get the blessing for everybody. So that all of you can fulfill destiny. That all of you can run the race. All of you. We're all called to serve. We're all called to do what God is calling us to do. But believe me, there is a divine order. When I go to the nations I go to, I always look for a father and a mother. And this was the counsel of my fathers. When I go to Guatemala, Pastor Solaris, Pastor Solaris, you are a father in this nation. Will you cover me? Can I come into this nation and I submit to you? Not presumptuously, I'm going there and I got all this authority. I have nobody following me to have authority. I mean, there is such presumption sometimes in the church. But I started to understand that there were fathers and mothers that wanted to release a blessing on me and release me and send me so that when I was going, I wasn't going alone. You know, a few years ago, I got quite sick, and I called my pastor, Pastor Gideon, Papa Gideon, we call him, and I said, Papa Gideon, I need prayer. He said, I'm going to call on the Chinese, the network of 1.5 million intercessors, and they're going to start to pray for you. I tell you that God is my witness. I was laying in my bed, and I felt like I was floating. I didn't have to carry myself. I had the backing of the family. I had my fathers and mothers saying, hey, we're with you. You're not touching my son. That's our son. And we're going to bless him. And I remember I got better really quick. When I go out, like we are here now, my leadership, our fathers and mothers are praying for us. Therefore, they're praying for you. And they're covering us. And I sent them a message when we first got here. I can feel some warfare. They said, oh, we got your back. And I started to get message and message and message and message. We're praying for you. We got you. Don't worry. This morning prayer, we are praying for you. You know, I started to feel a little better. Hallelujah. We're not alone. So I learned to serve another man's vision. I learned to understand that the Lord was speaking to my leadership to lead, and I was called to follow. That was hard for me because I, my gift as a seer to see, I see a lot. But I wasn't anointed and appointed to lead at that time. And so the Holy Spirit said, serve them. Serve them. Just align. And then I started to pick up the same DNA. I started to pick up the same heart. I started to pick up the vision of the house more clear. I started to pick up family. And I really needed a father anyway. You know, it's, it's interesting because the Lord, uh, what's interesting about the Lord was he sure left a lot of problems with me. Like he could have saved me and changed me, but he chose to leave some things that I needed to work through with a family. He left some things I needed to learn to be a son to a father. He left some things I needed to learn to serve. And my father and mother and the spiritual leaders in our house began to bless us. And lay hands on us. Then they ordained us and sent us to the nations. Right, Pam? Is this helpful for some of you? Come on. The blessing. The Father's blessing. Now, really, Mark, how much more do you have, my friend? A little more? Just thoughts. Okay. Okay. Really what we're talking about in many ways, and this is what we touched on throughout the last few days on the Friday, Saturday, now this morning, we are really talking about in some ways Malachi 4, 5, 6, restoring hearts of fathers to, a, to the children. This is happening all over the earth, that God is starting to restore the hearts of fathers to children and family. 
He's starting to break the divisions. He's starting to deal with the spirit of lawlessness, which Paul said is already exists. And still today, even more so, isn't it becoming more obvious? Because we're in a season where he wants to break the curses. And he said, that's what he said. I'm going to restore hearts of fathers to children and children to fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And that's the season we're in. And so those sons that begin to submit to fathers and mothers, and, I, and this is a healthy house. Okay, we could talk a lot about what if it's not. You know, but right now we're talking about what if it is. And that's the places where we find God is starting to remove uh, the curse off many lives and off the land so that we can begin to influence culture. Like I said the other day, would Canada look different or America if we had a million homes with healthy moms and dads, <laughs> healthy fathers and mothers that are not cursing their children. You know, that we talked about yesterday, look at their neighbor and say, I bless my neighbor and start to love like never before because there is a river of love. There is a baptism of love that is going to change this nation and it is happening in many places. Let me assure you, we're seeing it happen. So I learned to be a son. I am still a son. As long as I live, I will be a son to my father. And by the way, I'm seeing my fathers and mothers getting older and a little bit forgetful. But when I cross the Jordan, in a sense of my, more and more of my destiny, I'm going to put them on my shoulders and take them with me. Yeah. Right? I'm not going to, oh, you know, they're starting to get a little. And now I'm going to, no way, father and mother for life. For life. Because I understand the power of unity and the power of oneness. So I cover, and this is another word, I cover, my, and I shared this at our last few days, my mother and father's weaknesses. I cover them. I bless them. Somebody came to me in our church. Can we have lunch? Sure. And then they sit me down and say, what do you think about what's going on in the church? And what do you think about Pastor Gideon? I said, don't you dare try to get me into your divisions you will not you will not talk about my spiritual parents like that by the way you want to have lunch I just I just won't have it I I, I was said if you want to talk to them the biblical example is you go to them right you go to them right Holy Spirit thank you Lord Boy, I got so much, I can't cover it all. But let me say a few more things. And this was my personal journey. Some of my friends who are still struggling, one of them, 20 years, he finally came to me and says, I don't get it. How come you're released? How come you're doing this? And I've sat in the church for 20 years, and it was the first time he asked the right questions. I've been waiting and waiting, and finally he said, I don't get it. Okay, tell me, what, tell me what's going on. Well, you have an independent spirit. You've never submitted to the leadership of this church. You've sat here for years, and you've blamed the church. And then you have saw the weaknesses of the leadership, and you decided to tell everybody about it. Don't say amen again. Just say ouch. Is this okay for you guys? You know, Paul said something interesting I've been thinking about, and I heard it from another prophet. He said... The blood of no man is on my hands. Nobody is on my hands because I am going to speak the full truth and the full counsel of God and not gloss over the word and leave some things out. Let's pretend that's not there. Uh, when we stand before the Lord, we are going to be accountable for what we have done in this life. And I don't want to hurt or harm anybody. Don't misunderstand. Prayer of Jabez, may I not cause pain. But sometimes... You know, for the, it, it's, it's hard for me to watch the ones that I see sit there year after year after year because they won't allow the Lord to deal with them. Right? And for many of you, you're, you're on a journey and serving well. But for some of you, you're wondering, why am I not released? Repent, submit, and allow the Lord to place you where he wants in the family. And that's another whole word. 
I am actually not the senior pastor of our church, thank the Lord, because I like what I do. But the pastor that leads now is uh, 13 years younger than me. And he's my pastor. Like, if this was my church, they're my pastors. I would submit to them. And by the way, when you're mature, you can talk about things. So it's not like I would be a boy to them. You know what I mean? But they would be my pastors. A couple more quick things. The reason the Lord is, is maturing the church for the fivefold to function, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, you know, but really moms and dads with a, with a deep love is to help mature us. We are coming out of a season of immaturity in the church to a season of maturity. That we're no longer children tossed to and fro. We don't have time. As the harvest is coming, we need to have a family to take care of them. And when it talks about coming undercover, and this is another thing I learned when I submitted to the family uh, and the apostles and prophets, their calling to was to nurture and prepare all the holy believers to do their own works of ministry. As they do this, they will enlarge and build up the body of Christ. And this is Ephesians 4, 11, 12. And then in Ephesians 4 and 14 and 15, it says this, and then our immaturity will end. And we will not be easily shaken by trouble. And in 4.16, and we will be made and built up and perfect in love. We, we're on a journey, friends. And, and I, everywhere I go, and I told you guys before, I'll finish with this. It's when, I, it's when I began to have many moms and dads to bless me. At least 16 at one point. And, and one of was the Egyptian prophet. Mom and dad, Chu. Uh, Cecil Mante. From, uh, you know, I had all these ones that began to speak life and bless me. Most of them are gone now. And I do what they do. But I reinforced you, when I go to a nation, your pastor's coming with me to Finland in a few weeks. We have covering there. The most senior father in the nation who's 78 is Pastor Papa Seppo. And when I go, I go to Papa Seppo and I say, Papa Seppo, we are here to serve your nation. And I will not do anything without your blessing. Will you cover us? Will you release us? And will, when we're here, will you speak into our lives if we say anything out of order, say or uncalled? You know, we know sometimes you don't know the culture. And I do that everywhere I go. And it's one of the secrets, I believe, why we're, why we're blessed. We get the blessing. Because we submit to the authority. Amen? Amen. I've got some. Uh, okay, well, I don't want to keep you guys too much longer, so I'm just going to say something quick about the older generation and something quick about the younger ones. You older ones, you've, I know that many of you have probably wondered, why has God let me go through so many struggles for so long? Raise your hand if that's true. <laughs> yeah. Some of you, God's allowed you to go through uh, what some people call the dark night of the soul. You, you haven't been able to, you, you've gone through a season where you couldn't feel God's presence very well. You couldn't hear him very well. Everything seemed to go wrong and people did not favor you. Some of you have been through Job-like situations. You might not have lost everything, but you may have lost reputation. You may have lost uh, uh, appreciation. You may have lost jobs. You may have lost career. You may have lost even a loved one. And you've wondered, why does God let that go on? And, and for so many of you, you, the healing process of transformation of who you are, transformation into the image of God has gone so slowly. And you've wondered why. Well, if you want to know the answer, look at the younger generation. This is the most compromising generation we've ever had. You know that more than, one, more than one third of young people today believe homosexuality is just fine. 
So many of them believe, I mean, a huge proportion of them believe that you can live with your girlfriend before you get married, sexually. Because after all, you love her and you're going to marry her eventually. It is the most compromising generation. But I've discovered as I've counseled young people that um, here and there, there are some of the most uncompromising young people, so much more uncompromising than we are. And it's, it's because, you know, the scripture says in Proverbs 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. The sense of the Hebrew is you train the child according to his natural bent. This, is a, this younger generation is a generation that God designed to be the most uncompromising generation ever. And we have not trained them to be that. So the Lord has put you through these long, long seasons of struggle because when you're in a long season of struggle, you keep having to choose to go back to God for help over and over and over, even if you don't see the fruit of it yet. And it's built into you such a sense of commitment that you are starting to give the next generation something to model themselves after. A clarion call that says you need to rise up and be who you were designed to be. <clears throat> yeah, so I think we should need to close with some prayer and what should we pray for them? I think it's good if we have the pastors come up too because we want to you know, pray a blessing but really you want to hear it from us but you want to hear it from your, your senior leaders from your mom and dad. But for some of you, if you felt that in any way you've been misaligned, ask God and repent and say, I want to align my heart. Even if it's a little bit of what I was talking about. You know, because there's lots of people that are aligned in this house. But if you have a little piece of your heart, a little frustration, let's take a moment and first repent. You guys God, forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me for being unaligned. Forgive me for judging my, me Come up. my leadership. Forgive me for not fully coming along and being in the tent or the tabernacle of meeting with my leadership instead of standing in the doorpost. And what's going on over there? I see their weakness, you know. Come on, we're going on to maturity, right? We're heading somewhere together. We in our church fight from unity. We are not fighting for unity anymore. I'm telling you, there is a unity in our home church and in the many of the nations we work in. And we're, we're going, we're not trying to fight for you. We're already going forward. So just for a moment, we're going to say, Father, forgive us. Is that you? Anybody? And maybe if you don't know your heart, let's all say it together. Lord, we want to fully align with you. Want to fully align with you. And with the leadership pastoral team of this church. The pastoral team of this church. In Jesus' name, amen? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Could you, could you all just stand up? We just want to bless you. And uh, I do want to say this as well, just that as, as we do this, um, you can pray before you leave this place. I want to encourage you. If you guys could just turn on a little bit of music in the background, it would be great. Um, I just want to encourage you. We want to we want to have an opportunity to sow into their lives. We want to honor these fathers and mothers that 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 were sent. I always love to give an opportunity for people to do that. If you have a little extra and you want to sow in, you feel Lord leading you, then then please do that. You can mark ministry on your envelopes on the way out. You can just deposit it in the back. You can do it online any way you'd like. Just mark ministry. Everything will go to them, okay? Because we want to bless them. We want to be a blessing. And so uh, as God has sent fathers to us and mothers to us, we want to bless them, okay? And that's really important as we seek to be a house of, of mothers and fathers and, and to raise up sons and daughters in the house. So that's what we're doing. So um, just even right now, if you, if you want to receive a blessing, just put up your hands like you're going to receive something. Just, to, just imagine as, as we're speaking this over you that tangibly the Holy Spirit is putting something into your hands even as we heard the word that that blessing of the father was passed on to the sons and the daughters and it went 3,000 years and so even right now 
we just stand in the in the presence of the Holy Spirit the angels in heaven the witnesses I just bless you we bless you we bless you and we pray that the Lord would keep you he'd be gracious to you cause his face to shine upon you and we declare the shalom of God we bless you with the shalom of God the peace of God that there's nothing missing over your life nothing lacking nothing broken we bless your finances we bless your marriages we bless your children we bless your your parents so we bless the grandparents in this room the great grandparents we bless you and we pray favor the favor of God that surrounds you like a shield we bless your coming in and your going out we bless every part of your life that you would succeed in whatever you put your hands to we bless you that the words that you carry would bring life we bless you that you would walk in the harvest that you would be bountiful that you would have a harvest everywhere you turn you would succeed we bless you in the name of Jesus Christ we pray peace over your homes we pray peace over your workplaces. We pray peace over your marriages. And where there's been turmoil, we pray even right now in Jesus' name, peace be still. We pray peace over every storm in your life. If you have sickness, we pray healing. We release healing over you. We declare peace to shalom over your bodies, healing over your bodies in Jesus' name. If you've been barren, we speak fruit into your womb. We speak an opening of your womb even right now. We declare even right now, open wombs, fruitful wombs. If you've been barren in your ministry, we pray fruitfulness into your ministry. We pray, Lord, that you'd go ahead of your people even right now. I thank you, Father, that the blessing of the fathers is passed down to the sons and the daughters today in Jesus' name. And if you can receive that, can we just give God a big shout of praise? I think it's in Philippians where we read about the confidence that we can have confidence that he who began a good work in you will complete it and we were listening to a sermon this morning we're still our times are still kind of mixed up we were awake very early again this morning so we were listening to to a message on the life in the word how appropriate and the the words the 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 very words that come from the heart of God to us have so much life but not just for the moment they are eternal. They are life-giving. From the moment they leave his, his heart to us, they bring forth life. Seeds from, from God's heart, from, from his words, from the life that is in him that have laid dormant in you can still bring forth life. Yeah, yeah. Father, I bless the seed. Wow the seed that has been deposited into each of us from before we were born, the seed from when we were children, the seed from a grandparent who never got off their knees to pray for the children, the seed from that Sunday school teacher that went deep that we didn't even know was there, the seed from, from praying parents, the seed from visiting ministers, the seed from the pastors, the leaders, the parents, the godly parents that deposited seeds into each of us throughout the years. Father, we breathe life on those seeds again. And we say that they will bring forth fruit because if they came from the heart of God, they will never die. The seed of life in you will not die. And Father, we thank you for that confidence that we can have that you began a good work. Father, you began a good work. Say, that's me. That's me. There's a good work that was begun in you at some point along the way that has brought you to today. And we have confidence. Father, thank you for the confidence that you will continue to breathe life on it. And you will complete it. 
you will bring it to perfection, Father. Thank you for the completed work that you are bringing about in each of us. And today I bless you as you walk out in the completed living life that has been deposited in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, so in just, just a moment, we're going to, we're going to um, encourage, um, well, we're not going to encourage you to go because obviously if you want to stay, you can stay. We're going to bless you to go. But, but for some this morning, um, John's going to be praying over you this morning. But he's going he's gonna to initiate that. But what we're going to do is we're going to try to keep this room, um, let the presence of God just stay in this room. Try not to get distracted. If you want to visit, I'm just going to encourage you to go out into the foyer. And uh, we're going to keep this room a, a ministry room for the next little bit, okay? And uh, we're going to do that. So we, we just bless you in Jesus' name. We just pray that um, the Lord would go with you if you're leaving. We bless you. We, we can't wait to be with you again on Tuesday night for prayer. And for Kingdom Sessions on Fridays, we can't wait to impart. Long to be with you to impart something to you, okay? And uh, so if you need to go, God bless you. If you're okay to stay for a little bit, just uh, John's going to talk to you for a little bit. Just real quick, but if there's anybody in this room, be released if you need to go. If you have never met the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have never submitted your life, we're just checking. If you've not made a commitment to him, this is your day. This is your day to get a blessing. This is your day to start a new journey. If that's you, I want you to just be bold and come on up here to the front. If that's you. For some of you in the room, we want to play cause part, uh, pray because part of my message is, is around uh, the spirit of adoption, the spirit of sonship that, that some of you have never experienced. Some of you may be in this room and you have never received a father or mother blessing. And so we want to say, this is your day. The first step is to get a blessing that you are a child of God and that you are worthy, that you were born, that you were created by him. And so for anybody that just wants to get a mom and dad blessing, come on up to the front. If you feel that little peace in your heart, the little orphan, little bit inside, I don't really know who I am, come on up. And Pastor uh, Tracy, Rodney, maybe some of the, we're, we're going to pray too, Pam and I, but we want to, and Mark and Maureen, but well, some of the leadership here, the moms and dads, if you're uh, some of the moms and dads coming for a blessing, that's okay. But if there's others that want to help us pray, come on up, you know who you are. So Father, we want to pray. This is a day for some of you for the spirit of adoption, that you are worthy to be a part of the family that there is room at the table for everybody. Come on, he's got a big table. And there is room at the table for everybody. So, Father, we pray, we pray, the spirit of adoption to come in the room. Holy Spirit, Father, we want to break off. We want to break off that lie that they're orphans, that they're not a part of the family. God, we pray right now. Come on, ministry team, if you're not getting prayer, Come on up. And Pam, come and join me. Mark and Maureen, we want you to pray. Pastor Tracy, can you call some? And we're going to just come down and lay hands on you. Please, please, please. We want you to see past us to the Father. Past us to the Father. Turn your gaze on Him. In Jesus' name, amen. And just receive. Just receive. Don't pray out. Just receive. 